Hopefully that's working. I see the little recording dot. Excellent. Um, all right, so let me just stop sharing my screen so that Mike can get set up over in the, the side and I will give you sort of the ground rules. So yes, welcome again. Thank you, everybody. Um, as you can see, we have our video uh, and chat disabled for all of our participants. However, the, uh, sorry, the mic disabled for all of our participants. However, the chat is wide open and we encourage you to leave your um, questions in the chat so that I can read them aloud to Mike at the end uh, when we have our question and answer period. Today, uh, our presentation is going to be on persistent identifiers and their values. And um, our lovely presenter today is Mike Nason. So Mike Nason, let me tell you a bit about him. <laughs> Mike Nason is the Open Scholarship and Publishing Librarian at the University of New Brunswick um, in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. And he is also the metadata and cross-rev liaison with the Public Knowledge Project PKP and a PKP Publishing Services team member. Uh, Mike Nason is a legend. Uh, if you need to know about metadata, if you need to know about PIDs, he's the person to ask. And that's why we've asked him to host this webinar today. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Mike, uh, the one and only. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Emma. It's very funny. I, it's immediately in the chat, I got a DM from Israel asking if there'd be pictures of Frank today. And Frank, my cat, was literally just on camera right before he came in. So I'm sorry. I'll send you a picture later, Israel. Um, <clears throat> so today, we're going to talk about uh, persistent identifiers and open scholarly infrastructure. I have a lot to go over. I am regularly uh, encouraged to speak slowly. Um, for those who know me, that is not something that is easy for me to do, and especially when I have a huge docket. I'm going to try to move at a brisk pace so we get in under the hour. So I guess uh, buckle up, because <laughs> we're going we're gonna to get bumping. So about the first 40 minutes or so, we'll be in a review of persistent identifiers, open scholarly infrastructure, and what researchers and journal managers need to know, uh, DOIs, ORCID, ROAR, and other players in the PID space. And then the last 10 minutes or so uh, is going to be, it was originally about PID settings, um, but I think it's just going to be a surprise now because I made a last minute change because I'm a glutton for punishment. So uh, Emma already went over my introduction. Uh, just real quick, I'm the Open Scholarship and Publishing Librarian. Uh, I went to most of you would be a pretty small school in Atlantic Canada at the University of New Brunswick. I also work for PKP as a member of the Publishing Services team where I am the Crossrep and Metadata Liaison. I stand at this really interesting professional intersection between publishing, authoring, and discovery. Uh, and I feel fortunate to stand in that space. It means I get to see sort of the broad picture. Um, it also means I more or less never shut up about open scholarly infrastructure. Like a lot of people who don't shut up, I look like this. I'm a white Swiss settler from the unceded, aka stolen territory of the Mi'kmaq Lisquid people, just a short hop from the Wollastook River. Settlers to the region renamed this river the St. John River, a testament to both their repression and lack of creativity. Uh, lots of people, even to my professional dismay, many Canadians do not know where New Brunswick is. It is up here next to Maine. It is north of Nova Scotia and west of Prince Edward Island. Uh, I would like for you to keep a thought on the back burner today. Uh, this is a screenshot of SimCity 3000, 2000, 2000, the game released in 1993, which is pretty funny. Um, I want you to think about persistent identifiers as being in the drinking water of scholarly publishing. Uh, I'm going to come back to this and a lot. Uh, so get used to thinking about it. <clears throat> Let's start small. So the DOI. DOIs are ubiquitous. We see them all over the place. They're in references, bibliographies, on articles, journal, journal websites, uh, in repositories, published data sets, on links in Twitter, ResearchGate, all over the place we see these. <clears throat> we see them in the wild. So here's a screenshot of a citation in open air. And then right below it, we see the DOI underneath the authors of that article. We see them in citations. Uh, again, this is an APA style citation with the DOI in it. We're very used to seeing these. And we probably know one handy thing about DOIs. If you click on a DOI that looks like a link, it will take you to the thing. DOIs are the most prominent persistent identifier. They are also arguably the most important persistent identifier. So DOIs work like this. They're made up of two chunks. There's a prefix and a suffix. And together, these make one broader DOI. <clears throat> the prefix is usually associated with the publisher or an organization. Uh, DOIs for that organization will usually have the same prefix, unless they're huge, like Elsevier has like six or seven different prefixes across all of their individual publishing houses or something. But generally, a publisher or organization will have one. Uh, and then suffixes within. Suffixes are meant to be machine readable, not human readable. And I'll address that later on. Uh, opaque unique string that is specific to the singular work to which it is assigned. 
Uh, throughout this presentation, I'm going to hop into this DOI a few times. Um, it's a prefix held by Crossref member Atlantic Geoscience, which is a journal we host here at UMB Library. So I'll talk more about it in a bit. As you can see here, their suffix follows a pattern. And you can probably guess that pattern. Uh, this is very common, despite uh, it being both unnecessary and discouraged. If I prepend a DOI with HTTPS colon slash slash DOI.org, it turns into a URL. Clicking this will redirect me to the publication this DOI is associated with. The process of a DOI redirecting you to a publication is called resolution. So let's talk about resolution. DOI resolution works like this. Uh, DOIs aren't just a bit.ly link or a tiny URL. If you're not familiar with these services, they swap out a really big or unwieldy link so that you can share something that isn't enormous. For example, this bit.ly link on the screen here is the bit.ly link for this talk, but the actual URL for this talk is below. Bitly and tiny URL are both basic redirects. Their only purpose is to shorten the link length so that you can put it in a place, say like a poster presentation, if you had a huge link to a thing, it's now this big and you can fit it in a spot or they're easier to type in on the fly. Uh, but plenty of people treat DOIs this way or assume it's their only real function, that DOIs are just about redirects uh, and they absolutely aren't. And the other mistake people make is they often think that DOIs are some sort of certification, like something isn't published unless it has a DOI or DOIs are really uh, validation of some kind, anything can have a DOI. Uh, it doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't have to be an academic work. It doesn't have to be an article. I could make a, I could upload a wave file of a fart sound and give it a DOI. There's no, it can be anything. So it's really not, really not super uh, rigorous. Uh, but a DOI is a lot more than a redirect. A DOI is a reference to an entire publication record. And that publication record is full of metadata. And one of these metadata elements is the publication's URL. So when you resolve a DOI by clicking on it, this record is accessed. The stored URL is retrieved, and then you're sent to that stored URL. The URL can be updated by the publisher or whoever's managing those DOIs, but the DOI stays the same. Uh, I'm sorry to do this to you. There's a lot of information here, but this is an XML record for uh, an upload to Crossref. And there's a lot of information here. There's publisher, there's deposit and update timestamps, there's book types, uh, contributors, and the role uh, those contributors had, whether or not they were the first author or an additional author, titles, subtitles, publication dates, the DOI for the book, the link for the book, the chapter title, the DOI for the chapter, and the link for the chapter. So you can see a lot of metadata here, and this isn't even all of it. So again, take a look at this code for a second, we get a lot of XML. Uh, and at the top here, we can see we've got DOI, the timestamp for when that was registered, and then the resource link below. It. And then down here, we've got the DOI for the chapter, and then the resource link below that. URLs are part of the metadata of the DOI. When you change the location of content, you update your DOI with the new location. Everyone who uses the DOI gets the content, no matter where you put it, so long as that DOI is updated. This means the DOI is persistent. Neat. That's you, hopefully. Uh, and it is neat. Surely there is more to it. Right. So. Yeah, there's more to it. So let's review. DOIs are persistent identifiers. They are made up of prefixes and suffixes, each with their own meaning. Clicking on a DOI that is formatted as a URL will take me to the URL stored in that DOI's metadata record. A DOI's metadata record has heaps of information. DOIs are not just redirecting links. So we've got that all figured out. Congratulations, you now know more about DOIs than a frankly surprising number of people. And by extension, you now know more about PIDs than a frankly surprising number of people. Take it from me. Uh, let's step back a bit, though, now that we've got DOI sorted out and wrapped around our head a little bit, and talk about persistent identifiers. <clears throat> so, persistent identifiers are pretty straightforward. It's an identifier, a unique string of characters assigned to something, some place, or someone that can be used to identify it. And they're persistent, which means long lasting. They do not mean permanent, by the way. Some people think of PIDs as permanent identifiers, they are not permanent. Uh, if the service providing the persistent identifier goes away, uh, so too does that identifier. Uh, persistent is not equal permanent. DOIs are identifiers. DOI is an acronym for Digital Object Identifier. DOIs are used for articles, data sets, issues, journals, galleys, preprints, theses, proceedings, monographs, reports, standards, basically anything that falls under publication, and then a million other things. It doesn't really matter what, but in the publishing space, this is what we typically assign a DOI to. An identifier is something we're very familiar with. Uh, a unique string of characters assigned to something, someplace, or someone. So social insurance number, for example, in Canada, uh, is a persistent identifier. Driver's license number, Medicare number, license plate number is an identifier for a car, student number, an identifier for a student. We're assigned identifiers all the time, and we ideally carry ID with us. 
Identifiers typically refer to physical objects and are often created or managed locally. They're useful for record keeping and data retrieval, searchability, and they're useful for disambiguation. So a UNB student ID from my institution is only a useful label for UNB students. Social insurance numbers are provided federally, Medicare numbers are provided provincially, and a license plate is only a label for a current registered car. So for example, there is more than one Mike Nason in Canada, but only one of them has my social insurance number, or at least I hope so. PIDs obviously share all of these same benefits. A DOI is good for disambiguation, data retrieval, searchability, in the same way that a social insurance number is. It's like if every article published had its own tiny little registration with the government. We scratch the surface a bit on what a DOI does, but URL storage and redirection is just one benefit for one kind of persistent identifier. So what about persistence? Persistent identifiers most frequently refer to digital things. Traditionally, we share or locate digital things using a link, a URL, which stands for Uniform Resource Locator. And we know that URLs break all the time for lots of different reasons. We've all seen a 404 where we've played the little like dinosaur hoppy game in Firefox or Chrome when the link doesn't work. <clears throat> we know that URLs aren't super reliable. A URL can tell you where something was when you read it or when you cited it. If you bookmark that URL or put it in print, you're assuming that link will still work later. We know that this is not guaranteed. But as we discussed earlier, using DOIs, I can update the location if the content moves, and I can provide a persistent link to a record that contains a URL. As long as someone has the DOI and the, work, uh, the works register metadata is up to date, I can get to the content. The ID is persistent, where it directs me may change. A DOI is persistent, where the DOI resolves may change. Imagine finding this citation uh, in a bibliography. Which of these two would be more useful if the content moves from the website it's currently on? The first one has a nice big link. So if Taylor and Francis decides they want to change uh, the file path here from books uh, slash mono to just books, they want to take out the mono. Now that link doesn't work for people unless they put a server side redirect on. And you probably don't want to do those over and over and over again. But below, if they just update the metadata for where it lives, then you've got your DOI here. And that's a more reliable way to link the content. If I move my journal to a new web domain, uh, and as someone who works for a place that hosts journals, that happens <laughs> not infrequently, uh, I don't want every citation that exists to have an old URL. I want to be able to just update that registration and have it point to the new place. So the DOI works this way. It's a stand-in that, if updated, will not only resolve to the new location, but also contain all of the metadata related to that publication. So long as the service persists, any item with a DOI should be locatable. So what about PIDs for things that aren't publications? ORCID, for example. ORCID stands for Open Researcher and Contributor ID. It's also the name of the not-for-profit organization that provides ORCIDs and maintains the service and develops the website and API. If you're the kind of person who is bothered when people say PIN number, you will hate ORCID. No one says ORC IDs. So what is an ORCID? We typically call them ORCID IDs or ORCIDs. ORCID IDs are another kind of persistent identifier. First and foremost, ORCID IDs help consistently and properly identify the authors of works, no matter what their name is, was, or will be. Nearly every publisher can take an ORCID ID as the metadata associated with the publication, and they're included as metadata in a DOI. This means your identity and publication metadata can be completely unambiguous. So, for example, I might write my name as Mike Nason, Michael Nason, Michael Thomas William Nason, M. Nason, M. Nason, or Ahem Nason, and there may be more than any one of these in any individual place. Uh, the more variations and folks with the same name, the harder it is to find the stuff I've done. A PID for people makes attribution and discovery easier. So this is a quick look at open air for research products for Michael Nason. Uh, and the number one hit is this thing, religious media publications. Uh, this is for sure not me. Um, indulge me for a second and think about some rules you might assume about me. Uh, for example, many folks would likely assume that everyone has a first name and a last name. And I'm asking you to think about whether or not those presumptions are accurate. <clears throat> so here's some presumptions we make about names. This is from a blog post called Falsehoods Programmers Believe About Names. Um, and it's a really great place to go to think about how we record names. And I think especially in sort of Western cultures where we have a lot of assumptions about what names should look like and how they should be recorded. So there's a few presumptions here I'll call out. Stuff like people have exactly one canonical full name. People have exactly one full name which they go by. People's names fit within a certain defined amount of space. There are character limits, so sometimes we run into those. People's names don't change. People's names don't change, but only at a certain enumerated set of events. Names are written in ASCII. Names are written in any single character set. Names are case-sensitive or insensitive. Um, people's names are globally unique. 
almost globally unique. And then we really start to you on the right hand side here, two different systems containing data about the same person will use that same name for that person. Uh, so for example, two different journals with two different citation styles and display mandates will display the name of the same author in two different ways on their website. So we make a lot of presumptions about names. Names are actually kind of not a great way to identify someone. Um, when I went to high school, people would yell, hey, Mike, and no less than eight guys would turn around. Um, this is like a name that broadly fits into Western naming conventions and it matches expectations by major publishers. A name like Mike Mason is pretty straightforward. So let's say I'm submitting an article. This is the OJS uh, name field. We've got a given name, a family name, and a preferred public name. If I'm putting in Mike Mason, this is very, very straightforward. First name, last name, easy peasy. Uh, but to flag the name, <laughs> if a gender swapped a PKP or here, imagine my name was Alejandro Casas Nino de Rivera. And I'm trying to look at given name and family name and figure out which chunks of my identity belong in which box. <laughs> this is a thing that we ask people from other cultures to do all the time. Uh, and it really sucks. Uh, and this is a reason why ORCID is so good. Because if you have all of these people trying to figure out ways to jam their identities into boxes that were predetermined and don't fit their culture, then their names can be displayed in a million different ways that are out of their control in the long run. And that really stinks. So again, ORCID allows us just to replace all of that with a string. This is my ORCID ID. Uh, and yeah, it's a little, it's not, you know, it's not zesty. <laughs> it's not fun to be a string of numbers. But this is unambiguously me. If this is in publication metadata, you know I wrote it, which is really good. If information about me changes, my ORCID will still be the same. It doesn't matter where I work, how my identity might change, what differences exist culturally. Think of an ORCID as kind of a more feature-rich version of a student ID, but for your entire academic career. It's a way to identify you amongst everyone else who's publishing and doing that work uh, broadly. ORCID also provides users with what's known as an ORCID profile. Uh, these function as sort of an online CV where your employment, education, funding, works, and service are listed. When you hear someone talk about a scholar profile or researcher profile, they're probably talking about either ORCID or Scopus ID would kind of be the big two. Uh, maybe Google Scholar, uh, but they might be talking about something else entirely, like a website they made one time uh, that they like to send people to. Uh, we're going to come back to ORCID in a bit, but while we're here, I'll provide some links for a few other talks I've done about this, so you can get those later when I provide the deck. So, persistent identifiers. They make things easier to track, find, share, and access. If my articles have DOIs, I can provide persistent links to their most recent location, which will ensure ease of access and citation. If my ORCID ID is present as metadata in the DOIs of the work I publish, I can pull my publication record easily and add it to my ORCID profile, which has all of my other works in it. If a funding agency can pull metadata from my ORCID profile, they can acquire all of my publication metadata without me having to fill out a pile of forms, which is great because, you know, researchers do that more or less constantly. Pins are unique, unchanging identifiers representing objects, digital or otherwise, that can direct a user unambiguously to that object's current location or status and provide additional information and metadata. But a PID cannot do this unilaterally. No PID is an island. PIDs require a third party. Often folks use the phrase, and particularly in journal publishing, minting a DOI to describe the assignment of a DOI to a work. I see this a lot. The journal editor will contact me and say, I minted all these DOIs, but they don't work. I just get an error. Anybody can mint PIDs. Uh, and you can see the PID on the page and it's provided to you technically, but without the work of a registration agency, that PID doesn't do anything. They have to be registered for them to work. So minting only means the assigning part. It does not mean the registration part. What is a registration agency? So again, ask you to think about the water supply here for a second. Registration agencies uh, are the organizations that manage persistent identifiers. They are typically international not-for-profits. Uh, they store records and metadata. They facilitate resolution requests and may or may not offer other services based on membership. They do much of this through APIs, which I'll talk about in a second. There are a lot of registration agencies. I'm going to breeze through a couple here real quick. It's important to know that registration agencies differ in mandate, governance, scope, service, supported objects, membership terms, and feature sets. They are not all identical. They also often and work together and share data between one another. So quick review of the field. PIDs for scholarly works. So number one, Crossref. Uh, most scholarly publishers are Crossref members. At the time I wrote this uh, last week, Crossref had 155 plus million DOIs registered with their service. Crossref are a big deal in this space in academic publishing. Um, through them, you can assign DOIs to articles, proceedings, monographs, data sets, funding agencies, grants, reports, standards, and preprints. Uh, Crossref are, are, are major. Uh, Datacite, the other common spot, while some scholarly publishers use Datacite for article IDs, 
It is much more commonly used in repository, be they data or institutional or disciplinary. Uh, but data set and crossref work together to connect the research that spreads across both of those uh, types of publications anyway. Um, so for data set, you can assign DOIs to software, data sets, collections, audiovisual events, models, and with an asterisk, publications. Both of these organizations will kind of point at the other one saying, if you're going to register a data set with us, maybe you should go to data site. Then over at data site, it says, our scheme is not really that great at publications. You should probably use Crossref. They know that their schemas have strengths on either side. PIDs for researchers. So we've got ORCID, which is kind of loosely based on ISNI or related to ISNI. Uh, something like that. And then there's Scopus ID and Web of Science Researcher ID, which I never hear anybody talk about. Uh, ORCID are the go-to here with Scopus and Web of Science offerings, both re restricted to publications present on those platforms. Um, but the services can all share data between them. If you have a Scopus ID, you can push to ORCID and vice versa, easy peasy. And you have PIDs for organizations. So ROAR, uh, GRID, and ISNI again, organizations. These are, they're like good odds that most people will never really need to know what they're ROAR ID is. Um, the predominant use case for an organizational ID is for strengthening connections between records and institutions. This will show up mostly in the form of like a, a drop down menu that auto completes as the ROAR plugin does in OJS. Uh, ROARs are really useful in the same way that they are for human names. This is just an example of the variety of ways I see UNB written as. So UNB, University of New Brunswick, UNB F, UNB SJ, UNB Fredericton, University of New Brunswick, St. John. These are all varying ways, but you just go ROAR. <laughs> you walk away. So registration agency. Uh, reg registration agencies provide metadata schema through which um, users can describe the objects they are registering PIDs for. As you imagine, uh, you describe a person differently than you describe a data set or a journal article or an organization. Each has different metadata. You're describing different things. Even when agencies use the same type of PID, like the DOI, the schema they use may vary. Uh, let's take a look for the registered metadata in XML, XML format for that DOI from Atlantic Geoscience. So this is our great big honking monster record. We can see up here, we've got identifiers, citation IDs, journal IDs, timestamps. And down below, we've got the name and abbreviated title. We've got an ISSN. We've got the publication date. We've got the volume uh, title here. We've got the author and the sequence. So the first author here is Sandra Barr. Sandra has also entered French language metadata uh, in the name. It's kind of funny that it swaps the order, but it doesn't really matter. Um, and then we've got additional authors here in English and in French. And then below that, we've got an abstract, uh, sort of written in this big JATS format here. Publication dates, resources, text mining links. Uh, and then below that, we have unstructured citations for every citation that's here, including any DOIs that were matched against uh, with the Crossref API that have been added to the actual uh, reference record. So this is really great. You get a lot of metadata here and the references are huge. Um, you can learn a lot from those things. So unlike publications themselves, metadata is typically free and we can learn a lot from it. Crossref, for example, can store the following things as publicly accessible metadata, title, subtitle, authors, orchids, affiliation, copyright license, funders and grant IDs, languages, ROAR values, resources, uh, references, location, version, publisher, journal, volume issue, related DOIs, dates, and abstracts. Um, and Crossref makes all of this metadata available through a public API. Uh, I want to take a look real quick at that same registered metadata in JSON format directly using the Crossref API. I like to show people this because I think it's useful to understand that you can hit this data directly uh, whenever you want by learning how to do API queries in your browser. So this is the same record. <clears throat> I can see the same information here. Timestamps, uh, reference counts, which they can do because we've included the references and other people who have registered DOIs with Crossref also include the references. So if the references exist, Crossref can say, oh, this was cited X many times. Uh, publisher, that's here, UNB libraries, uh, abstract information. And then below, we've got all of our additional references here added. So that's an API look real quick. And then lastly, we can look at the title level metadata for that Crossref uh, account using the same API, which is also neat. So here I can see we've got a total of uh, 1,106 articles at that prefix. And I can see below uh, all of the varieties of these things. Uh, obviously, I'm not pulling up 1,000 records simultaneously. But all of this information about this publisher exists here at that API call.
So that's cool. And for kicks, here are some other potential queries with that same API. If you're the kind of person who likes to poke around, uh, the number of article titles on this prefix, all works registered with a specific ORCID ID, grant registrations by organization and cross-ref metadata, K and triagency, uh, poorly represented here, by the way, uh, list of top 10 most DOIs for this prefix, top 10 most cited DOIs for this prefix, um, limited to DOI title and citation count. Once you learn how to query the API, you can kind of learn a lot of extra information about it. So as you can see, the metadata that goes here, it's not just a redirect. <laughs> There's all this other stuff you can do with the metadata associated with DOIs. Um, is it time for me to tell you what an API is? Yes, uh, API, probably the most widely used and least understood acronyms in all of library science, I think. It stands for Application Programming Interface. An API is basically a set of rules for interacting with software. Think of it as being a little like a translator working as an intermediary between two people who don't speak the same language. APIs are everywhere. When my calendar app tells me today's forecast, it's accessing that information using the AccuWeather API. When my watch vibrates because I get a text message, that's because Garmin's API is communicating with Apple's notifications API. APIs are how disparate systems built by different people using different software coding languages and definitions find common ground and share information. This network of APIs that are pushing all of these persistent identifiers around between system to system are like a municipal water system. It is increasingly infrastructure relied upon by researchers and institutions, whether or not they are really aware of it. When I'm talking about open scholarly infrastructure, this is what I'm talking about. This network of open APIs with free open metadata and metrics capable of delivering information, metrics, context, and content. Almost all of open scholarly infrastructure is based around this interconnecting network of APIs. So again, the water supply. This is open scholarly infrastructure. Now you know what open scholarly infrastructure is. It's this network of scholarly research focused open source platforms, service providers, and APIs that work in concert to share data, illuminate relationships, and make research more discoverable. So for an example, let's pretend I'm setting up my ORCID account. Within ORCID, I can check against Crossref and Dataset APIs for any publications matching my name through the search and link wizard. It will take me a while to do this the first time, and it'll only work if my articles have DOIs in the first place, if they exist in those services. But for all my publications I know are mine and have DOIs, the metadata can be automatically pulled into my ORCID account. ORCID pulls that metadata from the Crossref API. So I can find an article in the search and link wizard. All of my registered metadata is what's used to create the record in ORCID. So here's an example from my own ORCID account where Crossref provided the metadata related to a publication. So now that I have an ORCID, that metadata ideally is included in the DOI when I publish. So any place I publish will have that ORCID record, ORCID ID in it, in the metadata. And then Crossref will see that ORCID ID and go, oh, well, we know this work belongs to this particular person. And they've already given us permission, permission to put stuff in the ORCID. So we'll just push it up. So now that's just going to happen automatically whenever my ORCID ID is in the DOI metadata of someplace I've published. Secondly, let's pretend I've applied for funding from an agency that has an ORCID account for integration. That agency can now push data into my ORCID account. Stuff like funding IDs, grant IDs, data sets, article service, whatever else they want to put. So I added a screenshot here from when CRKN in Canada added service of my time as the chair of the ORCIDCA governing committee to my ORCID record. Uh, and again, that's really handy to have that stuff be able to be pushed up from the actual institutions in which you're doing work. Example two, funders in ORCID. The next time I apply for funding, just push my ORCID to the agency and they can pull my work out for me without filling the same form again, which is really, really nice. Um, in Canada, we have this thing called the Canada Common CV um, that does not <laughs> accommodate this and it's baffling. So people have to populate their CCVs by hand. But if you could just point them at an ORCID record, I think it just sucked those publications up, then they would catch up with so many other countries. Uh, <laughs> it's something that is, you know, slowly evolving. Um, open scholarly infrastructure really ties the room together. So again, one more look at this. We've got ROAR, data site, Crossref, ORCID spread out. So data sites uh, pulling metadata from places like GitHub, Dataverse, and Noto. Crossref is getting metadata from places like Elsevier, Taylor, Francis, Archive, Sage, Plus, and, you know, thousands of other places, tens of thousands of other places. Uh, and then you've got places like Zotero and Mendeley that are pulling the metadata that exists in their citation tracking software from DOIs and their registered metadata. And you've got places like OpenAir and Google Scholar that are pulling information from other places as well. And then you've got CRIS systems at institutions and you've got funders who can also pull from this big pool of APIs in order to get metadata that they need. Uh, and then services like Unpaywall and Share Your Paper, places that are about 
accessibility of or access to open source or open access works. Um, so all of those things are interconnected. Without the Crossref API, for example, these, exam these examples that I'm providing would kind of fall apart. Publications that aren't using DLIs are essentially off the grid. And the absence of these connections results in a lot of folks entering the same metadata into systems over and over by hand or hiring graduate students to do it for them, uh, which is an excellent use of everyone's time. In concert with open scholarly infrastructure, PIDs allow us to see this huge picture through these connections and interactions. It can expose relationships between data and research or institutions and outcomes. It can make research outcomes more discoverable. When we talk about PIDs, we're talking about supporting open infrastructure and the free exchange of metadata. And then a quick word on metadata, and I'll talk about this more in a second. The metadata we get out of these systems and its utility is very much dependent on its quality. We have a general expression in the metadata universe that's garbage in, garbage out. Metadata is kind of everyone's responsibility. Researchers, librarians, publishers, registration agencies, everyone has a stake in accurate, usable metadata. Metadata is a very complicated topic, and I could talk about it for twice the length of this talk. Anytime, let me know, I'll do it. I understand that this is a lot to take in and I am moving at a pretty brisk clip, but what I'm hoping you'll come away with today is a little bit of perspective that PIDs aren't just links to things. They're not just academic bit.ly. They're not status symbols. They're not permanent and they're also not magic, but they are potentially huge time savers. They are useful for finding research. Uh, they're useful for interconnections between services and they are the backbone of open scholarly infrastructure as we know it. So now that you've got a little bit of an understanding about PIDs, let's talk about using them in OJS. This is a bit of a trick, actually. I just want to explain this for a second. Open Journal Systems um, uh, is hugely supportive of open scholarly infrastructure. In fact, OJS is an example of open scholarly infrastructure. It's free open source software that disseminates research. Um, things will vary a bit about how you activate these PID um, plugins and abilities, depending on the version of OJS you're running. Uh, and in this deck, I do cover both um, the LTS version, that's 3.3.x, and the current release, 3.4.x. Um, but the most important thing to remember here is if you're leveraging PIDs and other connections to open infrastructure, just stay up to date to at least the latest LTS version. If you get behind the update cycle on this, you are going to end up with deprecated software and, and other related problems. So at least the LTS is the way to go. So this section includes a bunch of information about configuring your DOI plugins in both versions, um, how to configure your cross or data site plugins, turning on ROAR, um, configuring Orchid with links to all of the software in the Docs Hub. And what I really wanted to do and actually did do originally is like go through all of this information about installing plugins and assigning DOIs and all of these other things. But then I decided if I just give you the deck, you'll just have that. And instead what I wanna do is actually a bonus round where I talk about metadata. Um, I finished this deck and I started thinking like, you know, all this documentation exists and I have these slides and maybe I don't need to go clean through it all step-by-step. Step. So instead I'd like to talk a little bit about why PIDs and metadata are so important in modern publishing. And I hope that's cool. I'm just gonna do it. So forgive me for being presumptive, but there's a general expectation. You want people to see the products of your hard work, I'm gonna guess. You want your work to be known and discoverable and accessible to the folks who might benefit from it, I would hope. And you'd probably like it to be attributed to you or your authors, since those are the people who did the work and since there are implications of their value on the careers of these people. It may seem weird because depending on where you are in your career or the kind of position you have, you're not super used to doing it or you don't really think about this a lot. After all, most of the experience of dissemination when someone's like a student, for example, is just submitting a paper to the one person who grades them, and then everything else is like question mark, profit, question mark. Um, it's certainly fine if this is the case and it's very normal. And I know a lot of established researchers who do not really think too hard about where and how their work is shared broadly. So this is like what we teach people uh, about publishing. Most of the time they're in school they're undergraduates and early graduate students, but we're not really talking about dissemination. You read something, you get an idea, you write your paper and you move on with your life. You don't really think about what happens after the thing is published. And sometimes even for established researchers, it's just like, well, it's on my CV. Later on, we'll talk about citations, end of the list. But submitting your work to modern academic publishing kicks off this enormous Rube Goldberg machine uh, of scholarly publishing infrastructure. We're talking about data, articles, preprints, presentations, proceedings, countless other things, things that are open, things that are not open, uh, and resources all over the place. It's really spread out. Your work is going to end up in a lot of places often without you even really being aware of it. So where do the products of research go? <clears throat> 
So there's a perception, I think, even with a lot of sort of long-term career folks, uh, that generally we know these things happen. Let's say I'm talking to researchers. So you submit articles to a journal, articles undergo peer review, your works are published, people who want to read those works can read them, things will get cited. The number of citations is very important. The number of citations is directly correlated with where you publish and OA might be required somehow. I'm assuming if you're on this call, you, I don't need to tell you on the benefits of OA. And for that, it's probably you know a non-starter, you know OA will be required, but a lot of researchers I talk to, that is not the case. This isn't wrong per se, these, these understandings, but it's definitely not the whole story. So here's an example of an author and two co-authors and what they might think happens when they submit to a journal. Uh, the article is peer reviewed. Uh, they get a version of record. That version of record goes to a publisher. Uh, and then that's added to their ORCID record. And then they're done. Uh, and the version of record has a DOI. Very straightforward. And actually, I'd say this is the case for a lot of OJS journals. This is kind of what the perception of the workflow is. But there's another reality here where someone who is publishing in a subscription journal publishes their work. It's peer reviewed. They get an accepted manuscript. They put that in a repository uh, that assigns a DOI with data site for self-archiving. And then they get a version of record. And then that version goes into their ORCID. And then those two have DOIs. But then <laughs> this other situation, which is actually, I'd say, much more common. And I think a thing that we don't typically think about too much. We've got the journal. We've got peer review. We've got an accepted manuscript, self-archiving data site, version of record ID. Did I just copy that twice? Yeah, sorry. It's the same slide twice. Um, Publishing is more iterative and tied to a wider range of accessible outputs than it's ever been. Submission still happens, but users might post their work on a preprint server before peer review. Funder mandate may require open access or at least an open access version of the work. If you're publishing in a major subscription journal, lots of people cannot read your work. Data management might require publication of a data set. So this stuff's evolving, right? The number of things you need to share as you go. This is the example I thought I was sharing before. So author and two co-authors. Uh, and the first thing they do before they even submit it is they have a preprint. <laughs> one of them puts the preprint in archive and they tweet about it in archive. The other author puts one in a repository that receives a copy in uh, a repository that uses a data site. And another author puts one in a repository that uses Crossref. And then another person puts a copy on their personal web page. They've done all of that before they've even submitted to a journal. Then they submit to the journal and they get an accepted manuscript when they're under mandate. So they decide they're going to share a copy. And that accepted manuscript, because of an agreement they have with that publisher, is automatically added to PubMed. Uh, and then there's one more repository copy that spawns over here on the left uh, that has a handle instead of a specific DOI. Uh, then they upload a data set, uh, probably to Dataverse. Uh, and the accepted manuscript goes into another IR or somewhere else. And the repository copies are now being picked up in OpenAir. Uh, so then the accepted manuscript goes into another IR for one of the other co-authors, because you have three people, all of these workflows are being split up three or four times. When you publish with three authors, you're not expecting one repository copy and one final version of the article. If all three of those authors are under mandate at their institutions to have a copy, they all go into three different repositories. So then you've got your IR, maybe that IR uses share your paper, which deposits a copy in Zenodo. When you've got a data set in Zenodo and a data set in Dataverse, two copies of the data, and then you've got your version of record, and then you've got your good ID. So any of these, you'll see these little green pluses showing up are all places that might have a DOI, <laughs> just a lot of them. And all of those are disseminated pieces of work. But if you know the DOIs for all of those things and the metadata is similar enough, a place like OpenAir can pull all of those records together into one coherent whole, matching things like ORCID IDs and the metadata and title matching and, and other things to sort of make a congealed sensible record. Oh, poop, accidentally, there we go. All of these are places your metadata can or will go. Uh, if you can jam, or if you jam editors B into the name field for something that doesn't have an actual author, guess where that will end up? So we go back here and we think about the fidelity of metadata. If at the big smiley face, when I submit to a journal, I make some liberties with my metadata, then that's going to disseminate in all of these places on the left-hand side, all of these repositories. That's where that metadata will go. If the journal makes a mistake with metadata, that's going to end up in the accepted manuscript and maybe in an initial publication on a version of record. And then it's going to end up in a bunch of repositories. And then maybe that metadata doesn't match what's in the data set. So now we've got four versions of the metadata that have been published and they're in a bajillion different places. And you don't totally even know that it's happening. 
So your metadata is going to go places. So this idea of putting editors, comma, the as an author name for a work that doesn't typically have an actual author, that's going to end up in a million places. Uh, for kicks, you should look up editors the as metadata in Google Scholar and see all of the articles pulled up with this shorthand uh, as the author name and citations in Google Scholar. It's a ton. If you manage a journal, you are standing at the nozzle of a metadata fire. I want you to think about this for a little bit. Like, as soon as you hit publish, that metadata is going to start going to all kinds of places. And even the corrections, when you make them, will take a while to propagate. And so Google Scholar, for example, when you first publish, uh, it will get crawled quickly. But if you make a correction, Google Scholar takes a long time to re-index and make a correction. So you want to make sure your metadata hygiene is good when you publish, because it's going to end up in all of these places pretty much right away. Um, this is important stuff for both a journal and for authors. Authors will know what they worked on, but people, researchers and funders looking for their work might not. Maybe they share a name with another researcher and the results are always commingled, or maybe their field only uses first name initials and metadata. Maybe there are lots of other reasons why their name would be different. Uh, maybe they change their name and it's painful or unpleasant that all their old publications require others to know it. Unless your name is wildly unique, I'm here to tell you that accurate, reliable attribution can definitely be a problem. Citation styles like API, APA are not equipped to deal with the varieties in both human identity and how modern research is shared. So again, even this required a student number. <laughs> we had an ID attached to the work we handed it as students so it could be more easily identified amongst all the other things like it. All researchers need to talk about the work they've done often and repeatedly, and researchers benefit from clear and ambiguous attribution. Persistent identifiers and the connections they expose aid dramatically the discovery, dissemination, and attribution of all of these disparate products of research. I cannot believe you are still talking. Um, this has been, frankly, an astounding amount of content, uh, and I'd like to congratulate you for enduring it. <laughs> it's about 45 minutes. It's actually more brisk than I had anticipated. Please remember, please, please, please remember that PIDs are definitely worth the effort, and once they're set up, more or less will handle themselves um, I would love to answer questions if we have time, but I assume as I'm writing this that we are definitely over time. And actually, we're not. That's pretty cool. Um, it's okay. I'm comfortable with myself. Please refer to this deck whenever you need to. Um, I will provide a link as soon as I'm done talking, and Emma will also share one out later. Um, and please also read the documentation at PKP. There's a lot of it. And again, I have links to it all here. Um, you know, stuff like setting up individual plugins and how to set up your plugin or your, uh, your uh, yeah, your plugins, your uh, registration plugins. Um, adding things to Crossref, information about Roar, information about Orchid, why you would want to use the public API over the member API, all this stuff at all. It's in the deck and it's in our docs and it's all in places. Okay, I'm starting to spin out here. <laughs> so I'll turn things over to questions, I think. Thank you, Mike. We'll give you a second to um, maybe get some water in. And um, if anybody has any questions, they want to share them either in the chat or the Q&A, which I did not realize was enabled, but makes things significantly easier for us, um, please go ahead and do that. Um, we did have a question, so just let me know when you're when you're feeling ready. Yeah. Sounds good. So I'm just uh, going to read it out. Sophie has asked us, uh, do you think uh, that we should give assigned DOIs for dissertations and theses in an institutional repository? What is your recommendation around that particular use case? Yeah, go for it. I think that's a very sensible thing to do. Um, I think uh, I have a lot of back and forth with people about DOIs and repositories because I think I think it's the well for one in a lot of repositories this happens automatically. If I've configured my repository to just assign a DOI every time I put something in it, um, you probably end up with a lot of extra data site DOIs for a bunch of stuff that already has DOIs in another place. Um, when I put work in our repository. I don't really think about assigning a DOI to something that's already been published elsewhere. I'll just put the DOI in for where the work is and say that this is a you know the, the accepted manuscript or whatever. But thesis and dissertations, I think, have real value because students do refer to them a lot. And it's possible you may update your repository or move to a different platform or change something. And being able to change all those links so that students aren't left in the lurch when they're trying to refer to their thesis when you know doing one thing or another is, is really important. Um, we just migrated platforms uh, this last year from Islandora to DSpace. And we didn't have any persistent identifiers at all in Islandora. And when we moved, a ton of students were emailing me like, I can't find my thesis. What do I do? Where do I go? Um, so yeah, I think I think DOIs for theses and dissertations is a good call. I think data site would be the better of the two services to register metadata for. Thank 
Thank you. Uh, I'll just give everybody maybe just a moment to see if there's any other questions. There's certainly a lot to process, so we might need some time to ruminate on it. And you're always welcome to come back to us uh, through any format uh, to ask your questions. But uh, if that's it, then thank you so much, first of all, Mike Nason, for your, your lovely and uh, incredibly informative presentation. And thank you to all of our attendees today. It was great to have you. Um, I will follow up or our communi uh, communications team will follow up with another link to the slides. There's also a link in the chat. And um hopefully the recording to this uh, webinar as well. So thank you so much. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your morning, afternoon, or evening. Thank you.